our Nike challenge, Just Be It. And it's all about the letter to the church in Ephesus, which is the letter to our church today. Hear these words from the second chapter. But now, in Christ Jesus, those of you who are far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For Christ is our peace. In his flesh he has made everyone into one and has broken down the dividing wall of hostility. He has abolished the law with its commandments and its ordinances so that Christ might create in himself one new humanity, thus making peace, and might reconcile all to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death hostility through it. So Christ came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him all have access through one spirit to God. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In Christ, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. This is the good news. The word of God for God's people. Would you pray with me a moment? Holy God, we thank you for your good news to us that you are at work in this creation, reconciling all things to yourself. I'd ask that you be in my words and all of our thoughts this morning, that this word of hope might take root in our lives in new and fresh ways, transforming us as we seek to follow in the way of Jesus. Amen. Old Joe lived in the countryside with just one neighbor. They'd been friends all their lives. Now their wives had both died and their children were grown and gone off to live in other places. So all that was left were their farms and each other. But one day they had an argument. Now it was over a silly thing, like most of these kinds of disputes are. This one was over a calf that neither of them really needed. Seems a calf had strayed, and Joe's neighbor found it on his property, so he claimed it as his own. But Joe said, no, wait, no, 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 no. That calf has the markings of my favorite cow. I know that's my calf. Well, it started there, and then it just built up some steam. You know how these things can go? Until finally, they weren't talking to each other for days, for weeks. The weeks turned into months. You can guess these two men were a little on the stubborn side. They dug their heels in and neither of them was willing to break the stony silence. Well, one day, Real early in the morning. I mean, Joe's a farmer. He's up. He hears a knock at the door. He goes to the door. He's not expecting anybody, but he goes, opens the door, and he sees a young man there. Seemed to have really dark, kind eyes, and he was carrying a box of tools with him. 
Looking for work, sir. Do you, do you have any odd jobs I might do? Well, Joe said, come on in. Have a cup of coffee. We'll talk about it. Uh, Joe was not one to just, you know, hire somebody on the spot. He had to test them out. While they're eating, conversing, Joe decides, you know, I kind of like this guy. I think he's all right. Yeah, he said, I, I got a job for you. Come on over, look out my window here. Takes him to the kitchen over the sink. See that ditch there along that property line between my neighbor and me? Yeah, that ditch wasn't always there. My neighbor put that in to spite me. One day he got out his plow and his tractor, went up to the north pond. He just dug a whole ditch and then he flooded it. So here's my project. I want you to do him one better. I want you to build a high fence so I never have to see my neighbor's property again. The young man said, I think I can do a job you'll like. Well, I got to go to town, said Joe, so I'll be gone all day. I got enough lumber and nails in the barn. You just get to work. So Joe hump, you know, hops in his pickup, goes off to town, and the carpenter goes to work. Oh, his work went smoothly, too. He was good at what he did. It was long about dusk. When old Joe came driving down his drive, he gets to the house, he sees what's happened. He's so astonished, he practically jumps out of the pickup before pulling the brake. The carpenter had not built a fence, but a bridge. And who was striding across it but Joe's neighbor with his hand out to Joe. And he cries, oh, Joe, it was good of you to build that bridge. Joe walks a little closer to him and puts out his hand and his neighbor says, Joe, I missed you. And uh, uh, Joe, the calf, it's yours. It doesn't matter, said Joe. And the two men embraced, but Joe had to turn away because he was beginning to weep. Well, then he saw the carpenter. He picked up his tools, and he was going down the long drive, and Joe says, wait, wait, I've got some more odd jobs for you. The carpenter just turned and smiled at Joe, and his neighbor gave a wave and went on down the lane. I like this story. This story reminds me that our God is in the reconciliation business. You heard it said in Ephesians that in Christ, what God has done for us, as Ephesians keeps keeps saying, in Christ, we are now to be in God's world, reconcilers. Well, it's easier said than done, of course. Most of us prefer to nurse our wounds, like old Joe and his neighbor, protect our pride, let our ego take hold, stay in control, blame the other, build a ditch or a fence out of our own bitterness. But God doesn't want it to be that way for us. Our faith says that God wants us to have life and life abundant. God wants us to live in what I think of as a flow. The flow of energy is this. We receive the love and forgiveness and grace undeserved from God. And because we have, it flows through us to others. Now, of course, we can dam up this flow at any point. We can dam it up in our relationship with the Holy One or on the other side, with our relationships with one another. But how do we go about the act of reconciliation with someone with whom there's been a breach in our relationship? If we examine Jesus' teachings carefully, 
we see that he actually teaches us and embodies the way. For memory purposes, which I need these days, little pneumatic devices, I'm going to call this the ABCs of reconciliation. Even though ABC sounds like it should be easy, and reconciliation is anything but. Well, let's let the A stand for approach. Jesus teaches us that we are to approach the other person in private, and they got angrier and angrier. You know how that is, right? The more you stew on something, the hotter the stew gets. Neither of them was willing to make the first move. But scripture is very clear. When we have a problem, we make the first move. It is always up to us to A, approach the person in private. Go directly, try to work it out. Scripture does not suggest we dig a ditch and flood it, nor does it suggest we build a fence to hide behind. Scripture does not say, email the person. Tell them your complaint and copy everybody in your address book. Nor does it say, write a letter to the person's superior and copy the person. It does not say to bring it up at a dinner party or to discuss it with your small group in order to get them to agree with you about how bad the other person was. Neither does it say to call your friends on the phone and gossip about it. Jesus says, approach the person. What a novel idea. Work it out between the two of you in private. That's the A. We see that Joe and his neighbor couldn't do it. Well, let's let B stand for be ready to listen. The problem is too many of us just want to talk. We want to say our side of the story. We don't really want to listen. And so we charge in there with our complaints and the other person can't even hear us. Too many of us approach situations where we feel wronged with an attitude spoken or unspoken that says, I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. If they only knew how they were creating this problem, then everything would be okay. And even if we don't say those words out loud, I mean... We're sophisticated enough not to, most of us. Even if we don't say them, people can sense where we're coming from. They get the vibe of our judgment. And it never works. It just puts the other person on the defensive so they can't even hear. And the chance for reconciliation is lost. In the book of James, it says everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. James suggests that our first agenda is to seek understanding before we say anything. That means we will be centered, quiet enough to listen, ready to ask questions, not pass our judgments, and our pronouncements. We then have a much better chance of being heard and true reconciliation might be possible. But you know in that story, old Joe and his neighbor, they couldn't do that either. They preferred to stay stuck for months on end in blame mode. And the more they thought about it, the angrier they got and the more right they thought they were. Remember, what we focus on enlarges. A, approach the person in private. B, be ready to listen. And now let's let C stand for 
communicate clearly and carefully. Carefully, because we want to speak the truth in love. When we go and we speak the truth, as we see it, of course, to the person with whom we're in conflict after having listened carefully, we need to be willing to be honest, direct, without attacking or blaming, or without avoiding skirting around the real issues. A lot of us are also good at that. We are to tell the other as clearly as we can what we perceive the situation to be. Now, this is after having listened, right? We have to be willing to be really honest and say how this breach is affecting the relationship for us. Speaking the truth in love will also mean that we take responsibility for our part of this breach in the relationship. Because the truth is, it is never all one person's fault, despite how we think it is. We all own a part of every relationship breakdown. And when we go to another, approaching that person, and we try to say how we're feeling about this breach in the relationship, We have to first be willing to own our piece of it. So we could add to uh, clearly and carefully another C, willing to own up to our own culpability. In in, uh, 12-step programs, they say you've got to clean up your side of the street. We have to be willing to do that, to take responsibility for our own behavior. Now, my favorite line in the story of old Joe and the carpenter is when the neighbor says, I missed you, Joe. What's he doing? He's saying how this breach in the relationship feels for him. And then what does he do? That calf, it's yours. He owns up to the fact that he had made a mistake. He was able finally to let go of his stubborn pride and be honest and make the importance of the relationship the main thing. You know what they say, do you want to be right or do you want to be close? He chose close. But of course, in this story, if the carpenter had not intervened, they might still have had a fence and a ditch between them. So what is the intervention that God provides for us? It's God's own love and forgiveness for us, shown to us in Christ. Our faith teaches us If God has been so gracious to forgive us of our shortcomings, we must forgive one another. That's the flow. So perhaps these ABCs for reconciliation might give us a place to start if if we have a relationship that's got a ditch or a fence going on. Approach the person in private. Be ready to listen. Speak carefully, clearly, own your own culpability. Now, these are the basics, but by far the most important thing is the attitude we go with. We need to have an attitude that says, this relationship is important to me. I value you. How can we work this out? I love that moment in the story when the neighbor's striding across the bridge and he thanks Joe for building the bridge. He's showing in that moment that he wants a relationship. He wants 
their friendship to be repaired, and he's thinking only the best about Joe. And then Joe says, about the calf, it doesn't matter. See, Joe, too, is willing. He hugs him, right? And he begins to weep. Why? Because this relationship's important. It was much more important to Joe in that moment to be close than to be right. He could have said, I told you so. From the beginning, I told you that was my calf. And there they go again. But I'm not naive. I know it will not always happen. Sometimes the person with whom we have a breach in a relationship doesn't want to reconcile with us. It's just where they are on their journey. Sometimes they don't see there's a problem. Sometimes they really aren't capable of admitting maybe they had something to do with this too. Some people just want to stay in blame mode and not really seek healing. And I have to say, some people really, on their journey, I say it without judgment, they're just too unhealthy psychologically, spiritually, in order to seek reconciliation. With these kinds of people, sometimes the best that we can do is not engage with them. It might not be safe for us to do it. If a person isn't interested in healing a relationship, we can try, but really there's not much we can do about it. They have their side of the street. We have ours. We can forgive them. Forgiveness is is in our own heart. That work we can do but we can't reconcile unless they're willing. It takes two for reconciliation. So sometimes you have to distance yourself for your own sake, for your own integrity, for your other relationships. Sometimes after trying all you know to do, being very clear with God on the inside, sometimes all you can do is just hand it over and let God work. You know, old Joe didn't know what he was doing when he hired that carpenter. But he was putting things in God's hands. I love it when the carpenter says, I can do a job you'll like. And so it is. We never have to pursue reconciliation alone. God is with us. In Christ, God goes before us and Christ is with us in the act of reconciliation. For as the scripture says, Christ is our peace. Christ has broken down the dividing wall of hostility and is in God's business of building bridges of love. Reconciled, we are in Christ, just be it.